All right, my watch says it's uh, 11 o'clock Central Time, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started here. I want to welcome everybody today to our webinar on the healthcare reform law and its impacts to uh, COBRA and uh, COBRA qualified beneficiaries. Uh, just a couple uh, logistical items before we get started. Uh, we have uh, uh, gotten this webinar pre-approved for one general HRCI credit. Uh, however, in order to receive that credit, we do need you to remain on this webinar for the entire duration. And assuming you do that, uh, we will uh, send out a certificate of completion via email uh, within the next two to three business days. So you'll probably receive that early next week. And with that email, we will also include a PDF copy of this presentation. Uh, also, just want to let everybody know we have uh, muted everybody upon entry. Uh, we're going to do that to eliminate any background noise, and uh, we will not be opening up the phone lines at all during today's webinar. Uh, if you do have questions, uh, you're more than welcome to use the chat function. Uh, it should be at the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Uh, however, due to the number of attendees that we have uh, and the uh, one-hour time allotment, I uh, more than likely will not be able to address every question uh, but I will try to get to as many as I can. Uh, with that being said, I want to formally introduce myself to you. I know some of you that are joining us I've spoken with in the past and others I have not. Uh, and for those of you that don't know me, my name is David Lindgren. I am our uh, Compliance Officer here at Flexible Benefit Service Corporation uh, overseeing uh, compliance throughout uh, all departments within our organization. Uh, I want to give uh, you a little agenda for today. Uh, I want to briefly just talk about uh, who our organization is. We go by FLEX for short. Uh, then I'm going to start the uh, presentation with a uh, refresher on uh, some of the COBRA regulations. And then I want to talk about the Affordable Care Act, uh, also referred to as ACA, and its impacts uh, on uh, the COBRA marketplace. And then talk about uh, uh, some predictions and add some final comments uh, towards the end. And then hopefully I have a few minutes left over uh, for Q&A. Uh, I will do my best to, to try and make sure we are done by uh, 12 noon Central Time. Uh, so brief overview about who we are so we can uh, hopefully establish some uh, uh, credibility uh, with you. Uh, we are, uh, as I mentioned, Flexible Benefit Service Corporation. We go by FLEX for short. Uh, we're located in uh, Rosemont, Illinois. Uh, we have uh, 100 employees roughly uh, within our uh, home office. Uh, we celebrated last year our 25th anniversary uh, being in business, so very happy to celebrate that milestone. And we really have three primary business divisions within our organization. Uh, we are a general agency, a benefits administrator, and we also have our own private insurance exchange. And I want to talk uh, momentarily about each of those departments. Uh, as a general agency, uh, you can all also refer to us as an insurance wholesaler. Uh, we contract with about 4,000 independent uh, insurance agents and financial professionals throughout the country, and we uh, provide uh, support to them uh, for the delivery and distribution of multiple insurance company products, including those products offered by uh, some of the larger insurance organizations in the healthcare marketplace, uh, such as Aetna, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois, uh, United Healthcare, and some of the others that you see on the screen. Uh, however, we are not directly selling these products. Uh, we are uh, sort of indirectly uh, selling them through the insurance agent distribution channel. Uh, as a uh, benefits administrator, we do this at the third party level. Uh, employers outsource the administration uh, of some of their benefits to our organization. And in particular, uh, we administer a flexible spending accounts, cafeteria plans, health reimbursement arrangements. We have our own proprietary health savings accounts, and of course we administer COBRA. Uh, we have uh, employers with as few as uh, two employees that we uh, administer benefits for, all the way up to about 30,000 employees. So uh, a pretty broad range uh, in terms of the size of the employers that we work with. And uh, we're very happy that Business Insurance Magazine has ranked us as the ninth largest third party administrator in the country. Uh, and, you know, we would love to be a little higher on that list, but quite frankly, we're happy at number nine uh, in that uh, being that we only have 100 employees and all of the other uh, 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 administrators in that uh, uh, top ten list uh, are much larger in terms of the uh, number of personnel they employ. 
Uh, and lastly, we are, as I mentioned, uh, we have a private insurance exchange. We refer to it as InsureX Solutions. Uh, you're more than welcome to uh, check out our website, InsureXSolutions.com. Uh, but it really is an alternative health insurance solution uh, designed for employers and employees to, to ultimately save time and money. Uh, it's an online marketplace with multiple plan options. Uh, multiple insurance companies offer products. It's all done through the cloud, uh, the big buzzword, uh, has several decision support tools, uh, really gives employers the ability to fix their contribution to their employees and then let those employees use those dollars towards the purchase of coverage, either buying up or down in benefits. Uh, uh, we have uh, another niche markets that we support as well. Uh, we offer solutions for part-time employees, seasonal employees, retirees, and of course COBRA eligible. So. Uh, just want to uh, 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 let you know a little bit about that exchange. Now on to our uh, presentation uh, for the, the remainder of our duration here today. I uh, want to give everybody just a refresher on COBRA. You know, it, it, it's a very simple concept to understand, uh, but when you take a look at all the fine print and the details, it really does start to become a, a, a little complex. So want to make sure we're all on the, the same page here uh, and give everybody a little bit of a refresher here. Uh, so uh, COBRA stands for the Consolidated Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act. Uh, most people just call it COBRA. Uh, you, if you talk to, to, to many in the industry, they probably couldn't tell you what COBRA stands for, but uh, uh, now you have that information. Uh, COBRA now is almost 30 years old. It was actually passed in 1985. Uh, became uh, effective uh, and applicable to certain employers uh, starting in 1986. And uh, I've got some, some terms here that I have in quotation marks that I'm going to uh, uh, further define here momentarily. But it requires covered employers to provide qualified beneficiaries with health care continuation coverage. So uh, upon uh, uh, certain events being triggered, uh, employers are, off, are, are required uh, to comply with COBRA to offer the ability for uh, uh, these employees or former employees uh, to maintain coverage for a certain duration. And uh, really just some background information about why there is the COBRA law. Uh, you know, it's been, uh, there's been some informal uh, comments by uh, some Department of Labor officials and, and other agency officials uh, that said the reason COBRA was really passed uh, back in the 80s was to prevent a, a term that they referred to as job lock. Uh, you know, prior to the Affordable Care Act being passed, uh, in order for uh, somebody to be eligible for insurance coverage, uh, that was oftentimes uh, based on your health status. So if an employee tried to obtain coverage on their own, they might be refused coverage based on a, a certain uh, present or, or prior uh, medical condition. Or if they went from uh, uh, one job to the next, uh, they changed employers, uh, there would be uh, a gap in coverage and, and or they would be subject to a waiting period before any pre-existing conditions would be covered. And COBRA recognized that this dilemma uh, essentially existed uh, for certain employees and, uh, and hence was the creation of the law allowing employees to uh, maintain coverage for a certain time period upon uh, specific events occurring. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, in, in defining some of those terms in quotations, I want to talk about who is a covered employer. In other words, who is subject to COBRA? Uh, which employers must offer uh, health care continuation coverage? And the law says that 20, uh, a covered employer is one with 20 or more employees on more than 50% of the working days in the prior year. Uh, so, uh, you know, really applies to, to, to most businesses uh, with an exemption for, uh, for only those that have fewer than, than 20 employees. It applies uh, to uh, the private sector as well as uh, uh, local and state government employers. Uh, however, it does not apply to the federal government or certain religious organizations. Uh, however, as it relates to the federal government, there is a different health care continuation law that applies to uh, the, the federal government that works very similarly to COBRA. And in terms of uh, the, the coverage uh, that must be offered under COBRA uh, and allow that uh, a specific employee and or their dependents to continue that coverage, 
It applies to health plans. Well, health plans is, is a rather broad term. Does that just mean health insurance? No, it does not. It applies to other health-related coverage. So uh, it's going to apply to, to any major medical coverage that's offered by the employer. Uh, so that could be an HMO plan, a PPO plan, or a high deductible health plan. Uh, it's going to apply to any dental or vision coverage that's offered by the employer. Uh, if you offer a health reimbursement arrangement or an HRA, it's going to apply to that as well. And it's also going to apply to some flexible spending accounts or FSAs, uh, but only those that are underspent. And when we talk about the term underspent, it means the salary reduction by the employee uh, has uh, uh, essentially exceeded their reimbursement for the year. Um, uh, and this is just a partial list of, of plans that would cover any other health-related uh, benefit it would apply to. Uh, but some examples of benefits in which COBRA does not apply uh, would be non-health-related benefits. So uh, group life insurance uh, would not be subject to COBRA. Uh, Short-term disability and long-term disability would not be subject to COBRA. And believe it or not, health savings accounts are not subject to COBRA, and that's because health savings accounts are uh, actually uh, viewed as an independent uh, account that is owned by the employer. It is not a uh, account that is owned by the uh, employer. Uh, it, it just is something that could be funded by the employer. So that's just some uh, examples of what is and, and what isn't subject to COBRA. Uh, now let's talk about who is a qualified beneficiary. Who must the employer uh, offer health care continuation rights to? And uh, that would be any individual that is covered by the group health plan on the day prior to a qualifying event. We have another term there in quotes that I'm going to have to define here shortly. Uh, but generally speaking, that's going to be uh, uh, one of three uh, uh, different types of, uh, of people. It's going to be uh, the employee. It's going to be that employee's federally recognized spouse. Uh, based on uh, uh, some uh, adjustments to the law last year, uh, that's going to apply to any legally married uh, a spouse, whether it's same sex or opposite sex. Uh, however, generally would not apply to a domestic partner. Uh, and it's going to apply to uh, dependent children as well. Uh, again, the, the, uh, the key thing, though, it only applies to those that were covered on the plan on the day prior to a specific circumstance uh, occurring. Uh, now let's uh, uh, talk about a qualifying event. And a qualifying event under uh, COBRA is a situation that causes a qualified beneficiary to lose group health coverage or lose access to that group health coverage. And uh, really the type of event and uh, the specific person that is impacted will determine the amount of time, the maximum length of time uh, that COBRA must be offered to that individual. And uh, I put together a chart that I hope will uh, simplify uh, this information from you. And you don't need to, to struggle to write this down. We will get you a copy of this presentation in our follow-up email. Uh, but the uh, the length of COBRA, uh, the maximum length of COBRA that has to be offered does vary by qualifying event. So in a situation uh, where uh, an employee is voluntarily or involuntarily uh, terminating their employment for a reason other than gross misconduct, uh, COBRA uh, does have to be offered to that uh, covered employee, their spouse, as well as their dependent children for up to 18 months. Uh, similarly, if there uh, is an employee that experienced a reduction in hours, uh, possibly going from full-time to part-time, and as a result uh, uh, loses uh, uh, their, their group health insurance benefits, COPRA does have to be offered uh, to that covered employee, covered spouse, and covered dependent children uh, for a maximum of 18 months as well. Now, these first two qualifying events, I do have an asterisk uh, uh, next to those. And if you uh, uh, take a look at the bottom of your uh, slide on the screen, um, it says in, uh, essentially in certain situations, uh, coverage must be extended for an additional 11 months to a qualified beneficiary that becomes disabled within the first 60 days of, uh, of COBRA. So uh, that 18 months uh, uh, time period uh, may need to be extended to a total of 29 months 
in the event that somebody uh, experiences a disability uh, as determined by the Social Security Department. Now, the other uh, events uh, really are, are generally only going to apply to the, uh, the, the covered spouse and dependent children. Uh, if an employee becomes entitled to Medicare and uh, as a result they voluntarily uh, cancel coverage, uh, and canceling coverage then is going to create a loss in coverage for that spouse and child, uh, COBRA does have to be offered. And in that scenario, it is a, a maximum 36-month uh, continuation benefit for the spouse and child. If there is a divorce or legal separation of the employee, uh, that also will be a 36-month maximum coverage period uh, for that uh, uh, covered spouse and dependent children. Uh, if there is a death of the employee, uh, again, 36 months for the, the, the spouse and the dependent child or children. And then uh, the last one only applies to dependent children, and that would be when they uh, lose uh, eligibility status under the plan. Uh, uh, based on the Affordable Care Act, at minimum uh, throughout the country, uh, employers need to offer coverage to children up to the age of 26. In some states it does go beyond age 26, but, but in most states it is age 26. And uh, uh, in, that, in that particular scenario, uh, when that child, we refer to it as aging out, um, they are uh, offered access to COBRA uh, for up to 36 months. Now, in terms of electing COBRA, there's, there's not an obligation that the employer has to, has to you know, uh, force coverage on the, the employee, spouse, or child. They just have to offer them rights to continuing on that particular plan. Uh, one thing that's interesting with COBRA that you, you don't see uh, for an active employee is that each qualified beneficiary has an independent right to elect COBRA. Uh, so uh, in other words, the employee uh, can opt out of COBRA, but the sp spouse and or children can independently elect COBRA. And you won't see that as an option for an active uh, worker and their family members. Uh, generally, and only to, the only way to get a spouse and child uh, onto a policy for an active worker is for that employee also to elect coverage and to, to elect coverage uh, for the spouse and children. And uh, uh, that's not the case with COBRA. There is an independent election right for each person that was covered uh, under the plan. And there is a 60-day time period to elect coverage. Uh, and uh, that time period uh, starts from the date of the qualifying event or the date the election notice is sent to the employee, whichever is later. Um, so th that election notice uh, typically needs to be sent within 14 days uh, of notification of a qualifying event. Uh, so oftentimes it's going to be the date the notice is sent, not necessarily the date that the uh, actual event occurred. And it should be noted that coverage is retroactive. So uh, while, some, while a, a, an employee, spouse, or children have up to 60 days to elect COBRA, uh, let's say they wait to the 60th day, that coverage is going to be retroactive all the way back. So they're going to have to back pay those premiums, uh, and, and it's going to be retroactive so that there is no gap or break in coverage. And in most situations, uh, the qualified beneficiaries are going to lose any contributions that the employer was making towards their coverage. And so in most situations, COBRA is a self-pay uh, situation, uh, meaning the entire premium cost is charged to the qualified beneficiary. And there also is the ability to add a 2% administrative fee on top of the actual cost of coverage. So typically, uh, you're going to see uh, the entire cost charged to those uh, qualified beneficiaries except usually in situations where there might have been a layoff, and as part of that layoff, there's a severance package. Uh, outside of that, you usually don't see uh, employers uh, uh, continuing to uh, uh, pay for uh, all or a portion of that health care coverage. Okay, so that should hopefully be a, a refresher. Uh, by all means, there are, are several other uh, uh, rules and regulations that apply to COBRA, uh, but that just uh, hopefully gives you a good conceptual understanding of COBRA uh, and uh, the, the general uh, rights of COBRA. Uh, so now I want to talk uh, specifically about the, uh, the Affordable Care Act uh, or ACA or ACA. Uh, this is the, the health care reform law. 
uh, goes by uh, uh, several different names or nicknames. Uh, but I want to talk, uh, you know, more so specifically about how it actually impacts COBRA. Uh, so just a brief overview. I'm not going to get into all of the rules and regulations of the Affordable Care Act. We uh, by no means would have time to do that. Uh, but for those of you that uh, may not be as familiar with it, uh, this is the, the major health care reform law uh, that uh, was signed on March 23, 2010. And it really does make significant changes to, to health care in general, to group health plans, and the, the health insurance industry as, as a whole. A lot of new rules and regulations. Uh, but uh, just at a high level, one of the, uh, the, the more significant changes in particular uh, that the Affordable uh, Care Act implements is that it requires issuers or health insurance companies uh, to approve and issue coverage in the individual marketplace uh, regardless of medical history. So it does not matter uh, what somebody's health status is. Uh, it could be somebody, uh, you know, a cancer patient, somebody with, uh, you know, a, a heart condition. Uh, does not matter. The insurance company has to approve coverage, uh, and that coverage does have to include a particular package of benefits, and there can be no pre-existing waiting period uh, for those benefits. Uh, now, uh, one thing that is different in today's environment is that there are only certain time periods that uh, uh, someone can apply for individual coverage, uh, but as long as they are in one of those eligible time periods, they cannot be refused coverage by any issuer of coverage in the individual marketplace. So as a result, a lot of people are questioning, what, what really is the impact to COBRA? You know, one of the primary reasons we have COBRA is that it could be difficult, at least in prior years, it could be difficult to find other coverage uh, especially for those that have a, a medical condition. And if now you can't be refused coverage based on your medical history, does that change or alter or, 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 or modify COBRA in any way, shape, or form? So it's, it's something that's been talked about uh, by, by a lot of us in the industry. And uh, as a result, the Department of Labor, or DOL, uh, did put out, uh, it was really just about a half page of information uh, that specifically said uh, uh, even though we have the Affordable Care Act and some things have changed, uh, COBRA itself has not been eliminated, nor have any of the rules changed. So it's, it's sort of a business as usual approach when we talk about COBRA and the administration of COBRA. So all of the same rules and regulations apply, so that the refresher information, all of that still applies. So, so while, while there really aren't any direct changes to COBRA, there are most certainly a lot of indirect impacts uh, that are occurring with, within the COBRA law, and, and that's really what I want to focus on for the rest of our presentation here today. So first off, uh, there are specific notices that need to be communicated to employees uh, and or uh, that employee's covered spouse. And uh, these notices uh, have required language that must be included and uh, employers or, or third-party administrators on behalf of employers uh, have to provide uh, these notices uh, to qualified beneficiaries at specific times. And uh, probably the two most important notices uh, that must be provided are uh, the general notice and the election notice. Uh, so first off, uh, I want to talk about the general notice, uh, which uh, uh, you know some some people also refer to it as the initial notice. It uh, doesn't matter to me uh, what you call it. Just know they're uh, they're viewed as one and the same. Uh, but this is a notice, uh, a document that must be provided to the employee, and if the employee is covering their spouse, it must also be provided to the spouse uh, within 90 days of enrolling in coverage. Uh, now, a lot of times uh, uh, this notice is provided with open enrollment materials does not have to be, it just needs to be provided within 90 days of that employee and spouse initially enrolling uh, in, in coverage for the plan year. And uh, really the general notice uh, just provides some basic information uh, to the employee and their covered spouse about what COBRA is. You know, what are, uh, uh, what are their rights in general uh, uh, if they experience an event that results in a loss of coverage. So, 
uh, you know, it's not uh, too long of a form, but just provides some general details. Uh, well, the Affordable Care Act now requires uh, some changes or, or some additions, I should say, uh, to that general notice or that initial notice. And uh, now that general notice must include information about alternative coverage options that might be available through the health insurance marketplace, also known as the exchange. Uh, so just some basic information about individual market coverage through the exchange. And, uh, uh, and then there's also the election notice. The election notice had some, uh, some more substantial uh, modifications and a lot of new language that is required to be uh, included in that notice. Uh, the election notice, as I mentioned before, must be provided uh, uh, to qualified beneficiaries uh, within 14 days of that employer uh, receiving notice of the qualifying event. And uh, uh, similarly to the, the general notice or the initial notice, uh, the election notice must now include information about alternative coverage options available through the exchange. Uh, but it also gets, gets more detailed. Uh, as I mentioned before, there's only certain time periods that, uh, that someone uh, can enroll in individual market coverage. And there is some more detailed information in the election notice uh, about special enrollment rights and special enrollment time periods uh, that apply to the uh, exchange or the health insurance marketplace. Now, one thing I want to add is that, uh, you know, last year, uh, there was uh, some requirements that uh, uh, were needed to be uh, changed or added to the election notice. And uh, really, after taking a second look at the notice, uh, government and agency officials decided uh, for a second time they were going to make uh, uh, updates to uh, the, the uh, general notice and the election notice. So uh, back in, in May of this year, uh, some model language was, was released, uh, model general notice and model uh, election notice were posted on the Department of Labor website and uh, uh, really are requiring or asking employers or the third party administrator on behalf of the employers uh, to add this new language. Uh, while they don't give a specific deadline, uh, uh, you know, it needs to be, be uh, you know, more or less uh, updated as quickly as practically possible. So if you made this change, uh, you know, towards the end of last year, um, just know that, that, that a secondary change uh, in additional language came out uh, this past May. Uh, so um, you may need to take a second look at those notices if you, if you haven't already. Um, and if you just do a general, uh, uh, you know, a, a search on the Internet through Google or Yahoo or whatever you use, uh, it, you just type uh, uh, model COBRA notices. Uh, you should uh, uh, have the Department of Labor uh, website pop up as one of your first options, and you can take a look at the model language. Now, uh, other uh, indirect impacts uh, of the, the health care reform law on, uh, uh, on COBRA uh, really uh, applies to these marketplace or the uh, exchange options. I, I've said twice now already uh, that enrollment into an individual health plan can only be done at certain times. Um, and uh, there, there will be an annual enrollment period every single year. Uh, the one uh, that is, 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 is quickly approaching now uh, will begin November 15, uh, 2014, and will extend through uh, February 15, 2015. So uh, during this time period, anybody, uh, uh, you know, any lawfully present uh, uh, a resident uh, uh, in America can, can go to uh, the exchange uh, and apply for coverage. And uh, if outside of these time periods, uh, there has to be a triggering event uh, to create a special enrollment period. And most special enrollment periods will give uh, individuals that experience a triggering event uh, a 60-day time period to sign up for coverage in the individual marketplace. And one of those triggering events is loss of minimum essential coverage. It's a new term that's used uh, in the uh, Affordable Care Act regulations. But in a situation where somebody, for example, uh, uh, quits their job or is fired from their job or their hours are reduced, uh, and that's going to result in a loss of coverage, that's going to create a qualifying event for a special enrollment period in the individual marketplace. And uh, uh, two things to know as it relates to COBRA, right? So first, uh, uh, upon experiencing that qualifying event, 
there will be a 60-day special enrollment period for uh, those qualified beneficiaries. Uh, in the individual marketplace. However, not everybody's going to take individual market coverage. Some people will want to continue on that group health plan uh, by a means of COBRA. And uh, if uh, a qualified beneficiary uh, elects COBRA, uh, then there will be a, a, an additional 60-day uh, special enrollment time period uh, that occurs after the maximum coverage period has been e exhausted. Uh, so really, they're going to have 60 days up front and 60 days at the end uh, to sign up for coverage uh, through the exchange marketplace. Uh, and I do have an asterisk there and that, that, uh, that font at the bottom of the screen says voluntarily terminating COBRA will not create a qualifying event for a special enrollment period. So if somebody does elect COBRA and let's say six or seven months down the road they decide uh, they want to cancel that plan, uh, they can cancel it by all means but because that's a voluntary termination, that's not going to be a qualifying event. They would have to actually uh, wait till the next annual enrollment period or maintain uh, coverage for the, the maximum duration. And once that maximum duration has been exhausted, uh, that would trigger the qualifying events. Now, uh, you've probably heard, uh, at least to some degree, information about subsidies uh, or, or, or premium tax credits. Uh, these are only available in the individual marketplace and only available uh, uh, to people that uh, meet certain criteria. Uh, and the exchange will, will provide uh, assistance to eligible individuals to help reduce their premium. This is referred to as the Advanced Premium Tax Credit or the APTC. Uh, so if their income is within a certain threshold uh, and they meet other requirements, uh, they're going to get some help uh, uh, with, uh, with paying their premiums through a subsidy from the government. And for uh, other certain eligible individuals, they also might, might receive a cost-sharing subsidy, and that cost-sharing uh, subsidy would help reduce their actual out-of-pocket expenses. So it would lower their deductible, their co-insurance, potentially their co-pays. Uh, but again, uh, these subsidies are only available uh, to eligible individuals. And uh, I do just want to add, uh, you know, when we take a look at this, uh, we've got to take a look at, okay, well, what, what, what's COBRA's uh, interaction with these subsidies? And it should be noted that any qualified beneficiary who enrolls in COBRA, uh, they, they still will generally be eligible for exchange coverage. Uh, it just depends on uh, whether or not they still may maintain their eligibility for subsidies. And if, if a qualified beneficiary does uh, accept a, a COBRA and enroll in COBRA, uh, he or she will not be eligible for subsidies. Uh, but if, if that qualified beneficiary foregoes, they, they waive their, their COBRA continuation, uh, uh, that particular individual will be eligible for subsidies assuming they meet the other requirements. And other requirements, these subsidies are largely based uh, on income. Uh, you, you generally must uh, have an income within 400% of, uh, of the targeted number identified by the federal poverty level. Uh, so that's going to be for a single person uh, uh, you know, with, an, with annual earnings of about $45,000 or less per year, or a family of four with approximately $95,000 or less in earnings per year. Uh, if you're within that threshold, uh, you, you're not enrolled in coverage elsewhere, you're not enrolled in COBRA, uh, there's a good chance you're going to be subsidy eligible. Now, I uh, want to talk a little bit about the employer shared responsibility. Uh, you may uh, more commonly know this as the employer mandate uh, that's scheduled uh, to take effect uh, for uh, applicable large employers uh, starting in 2015. Uh, some it, it will get uh, uh, some transition relief until 2016. Uh, but this is uh, the requirement. You've probably heard a lot about it. Uh, being business owners and HR professionals working with employee benefits, uh, that starting in, in 2015, employers that have 50 or more employees, and we've got to take into account full-time equivalents as well when determining the size of the employer, uh, they must offer a, you know, what we call minimum essential coverage, benefits that meet certain requirements under the health care reform law, uh, must offer this minimum essential coverage uh, to full-time employees uh, that uh, you don't see the term on here that provides uh, minimum value uh, and for purposes of, of this presentation we don't need to talk about that uh, but we need to talk about affordability the, 
uh, in order for uh, a applicable large employers to avoid penalties, they must be offering their full-time em employees uh, coverage that does not exceed 9.5% of that employee's W-2 wages for self-only coverage in order to uh, uh, eliminate any potential penalties uh, uh, that may apply. And uh, so then the question becomes, okay, if, if employers uh, need to offer coverage and, and make it affordable uh, based on the, these regulations, uh, do, they, do they have this same obligation uh, for, uh, for those that are enrolled in COBRA? And uh, uh, coming as good news to, to, for many of you, uh, uh, there is an affordability uh, safe harbor rule uh, that's in uh, Section 4980H of the IRS code uh, that exempts COBRA from any contribution requirement. So, uh, you know, in other words, uh, employers do not have to make any premium contributions towards COBRA coverage, uh, nor will they be penalized if they're not making any contributions. So, uh, again, uh, COBRA in most situations is going to be paid uh, completely by the qualified beneficiary uh, with uh, potentially up to a 2% administrative fee. Now, uh, let's talk about some, uh, some predictions and, and some final comments here, and then we'll get to our Q&A. You know, so we've kind of talked about COBRA. We went through the refresher, and, uh, and then we talked about the Affordable Care Act. And, and while there, there doesn't appear to be any direct impact to COBRA, there are sort of some indirect side effects. Uh, but now we've got to really take a look at, okay, how many people will actually enroll in COBRA? You know, the individual marketplace is going to be a more attractive and financially advantageous option uh, for a significant portion of qualified beneficiaries. So we now know individual market plans are guarantee issue. Uh, we now know uh, that uh, upon somebody uh, being eligible for COBRA, that's going to be a special enrollment period. So uh, there's going to be several different plan options in the individual market available, both uh, through the insurance exchange as well as outside of the insurance exchange. And presumably, uh, a significant portion of these options are going to be a cheaper alternative to COBRA. Uh, now, based on some, some data that we have and that we've obtained, we see, and, and also being an a, a administrator of COBRA for several employers throughout the country, we see the average COBRA premium, uh, and, and the average includes uh, a premium for, for you know, single only coverage as well as uh, those that are covering uh, spouses or dependents. But we see the average premium being somewhere around $785 per month uh, uh, for COBRA. You know, and that's a, that's that's a substantial amount of money because a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, Cobra eligible individuals don't actually realize how much the cost of coverage is uh, because they don't factor in the employer contribution. They're only thinking about how much they've had to pay through salary reduction for their uh, for their health plan. So the average premium is about seven hundred and eighty five dollars per month. And there was uh, some, some uh, materials that were released by the IRS, uh, I believe it was, uh, it might have been earlier this month, if not it was towards the end of last month. But it says the national average premium for a bronze tiered plan in the insurance exchange is $204 per month per individual. Uh, so you know, if you, had, if you had a husband and wife, you take that by two, husband, wife, and child, take that times three. Um, and these, these uh, premiums are prior to any subsidies. So if somebody is subsidy eligible, that 204 per month is going to be reduced uh, potentially uh, rather significantly. So now a, a bronze plan would be um, you know, a plan that is expected to pay on average about 60% of the, the average covered person's medical claims. There are other plans uh, that are uh, actuarially equivalent to covering 70, 80, or 90 percent of uh, of the average coverage person's plans. But you know, we're taking a look at 204 versus 785, and again, we're just dealing with averages. There's going to be a lot of cheaper alternatives out there uh, for somebody, uh, you know, instead of uh, electing Cobra. And you know, with an individual market plan, coverage can also be extended indefinitely. 
There's not an 18-month time period or a 36-month time period. As long as you keep making your monthly premium payments, you're going to be able to keep that coverage uh, you know, for as long as you desire. And then, you know, we talked about this already, but if somebody enrolls in COBRA, they're not going to be eligible for subsidies. So, um, you know, by, uh, by defecting or, or, or waiving COBRA rights, uh, you know, that individual uh, might still be able to access subsidies if they're with, within the income threshold to meet, meet some other criteria. So the individual marketplace is looking pretty good for, for a lot of these, these COBRA-eligible individuals. And I, I got some, some great data here that's, that's, that's rather current as well I wanted to share with you. Uh, th this comes uh, uh, from, from an external source, a company called Benesance, uh, who uh, you know, administers uh, COBRA for, for uh, a quite, a, quite a few different organizations. Uh, and this data comes, I, I think, uh, is, it, it utilizes approximately 2 million qualifying events. So it's, it's rather good sample size. But if we take a look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use an arrow here now, uh, at, at the COBRA election rate trend. Uh, I've got some data here that goes back to 2009 and uh, is all the way current through, through May of this year. Uh, if you take a look here, uh, you know, in 2009, um, you know, it looks like COBRA election rates were somewhere, uh, you know, around 37, 38 uh, percent. So, the, you know, the number of people that were offered COBRA uh, you know, a, 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 in terms of uh, actually electing, turned into about 37, 38 percent, and uh, that's rather high in comparison to uh, to today. Uh, you also have to keep in mind, back in 2009, uh, we were we were dealing with the American uh, Recovery and Reinvestment Act, uh, also known as ARRA or or ARRA, um, and, and that uh, was was uh, you know we were in uh, uh, the Great Recession, uh, sort of the height of the Great Recession. And um, uh, the government was was uh, subsidizing some of the COBRA premiums, and so we saw some rather high election rates. But you see, these numbers have uh, started to skew downward, and now when we're taking a look at where we're at today, uh, COBRA election rates have dipped below 10 percent. So less than one in 10 people that are offered COBRA actually take it. Uh, so that means really one of two things. They're either going uninsured or they're finding coverage elsewhere, possibly through a spouse's health plan uh, or, or a significant portion are probably looking to that individual marketplace. And just to sort of elaborate a little further on these election trends, I sort of got a, a year-to-date year -to comparison through May uh, from 2013 to 2014. And uh, uh, COBRA election rates were reduced by 25% just over this time period. So you saw in January of 2013, uh, we were dealing with approximately 14% uh, uh, of uh, people that were offered COBRA were electing, and uh, that number dipped uh, to just below 10% uh, in January. And you can see there's some slight fluctuation. Some months it's up a little bit, some months it's down a little bit. Uh, but overall, uh, you know, th those rates are now uh, consistently below 10%, uh, usually somewhere around 8 or 9%. And, uh, you know, not a lot of people are, are taking COBRA based on, on this, this data uh, that we've collected. Now, if we take a look at who might actually enroll in COBRA, um, that would be, uh, you know, those people that have a, a, a qualified beneficiary receiving a severance package. Uh, you know, a lot of times if there's a layoff, those individuals will, uh, you, you know, receive a, a portion or all of their COBRA premium covered. Uh, and in that scenario, COBRA might be cheaper for them. Uh, anybody that's met, a, you know, all or a significant portion of their health plan deductible, uh, they might, uh, they may, might want to, you know, continue on that, that health plan because uh, they don't want to enroll in another plan where they'd have to start a deductible all over. Uh, some of your older individuals, depending on uh, geographically where you live, may not have as many uh, cheaper uh, alternatives in the individual marketplace. Though there will probably still be some, uh, but not uh, uh, to the magnitude that would be available to uh, a younger uh, person. Uh, in the individual marketplace, uh, age is one of the, the rating factors that's taken into account. And uh, I, I don't know how to say this uh, uh, very intelligently, but Really, anybody that likes their coverage uh, and, and, of course, can afford 
uh, COBRA premium payments, uh, you know, they would be somebody who would be probable in electing. Uh, so somebody maybe that's you know really likes the the network that's available through their group health plan, uh, possibly somebody that's undergoing current treatment, and uh, they don't want any any disruption in that treatment uh, through their coverage. And then lastly, uh, you know, there's going to be qualified beneficiaries that, that that might not necessarily enroll in the in the major medical health plan, uh, but they may elect Cobra for other reasons, such as you know dental benefits or vision benefits or or flexible spending accounts that uh, may, may have a, a, a much lower premium than, than their the major medical counterpart. So uh, just a few uh, final comments here. Um, you know, really uh, we see COBRA and the Affordable Care Act uh, coexisting for the uh, foreseeable future. So I would not anticipate any uh, dramatic changes uh, if I had to, uh, to, to, to make a bet uh, I, I do not foresee any any significant changes uh, to COBRA, um, at least the, the regulatory uh, statute, uh, anytime in the near future. Um, you know, a couple questions that are still out there is where where and when will the election rates sort of sort of flatline? We see them gradually uh, dipping uh, over time, now below 10 percent. You know, will they level off somewhere at you know four or five percent? I'm not certain. Uh, we don't have enough, uh, uh, you know, time uh, behind us now to, to to provide that data, and then you know, ultimately, you know, with with so few people actually electing Cobra, and uh, with the idea that job lock is no longer uh, really an, an issue as it relates to to group health plan coverage, you know, will there ever be any statutory or regulatory revision to Cobra? Uh, you know, we'll have to see. If, if, if not many people are electing, uh, you know, maybe the regulators will, will, will take another look at COBRA and, and make some, some modifications. So really, uh, you know, FC answer to these questions are, are unknown, uh, but, uh, but really from an administrative perspective and, and from uh, uh, the liability as it relates to COBRA for an employer, uh, you really need to be staying the same course. So. Uh, got to get those general notices out. Got to get those election notices out. You got to give people uh, the right to elect COBRA for the same uh, maximum durations uh, that uh, that we've become familiar with over time. Uh, with that being said, that wraps up my uh, presentation. I see some questions have already uh, uh, come through. Uh, again, uh, I've got several uh, uh, participants on the call today, so. I don't know how, if I'll be able to get to all of them. I'll do my best to get to as many of them as I can. But please go ahead and use that chat function uh, and, and uh, uh, type in your questions. Uh, just as a, a, a reminder, uh, as indicated at the beginning of the presentation, uh, for those of you that have uh, remained on for the, the, the maximum length of time uh, of this webinar, we will send out a copy of the presentation along with that uh, general HR uh, CI uh, uh, credits. Uh, if you want to get a hold of us by phone, uh, we've got uh, 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 different phone numbers on there for our, our, our different departments. Uh, you may also visit our website or uh, visit us on any of our social media sites. Um, now uh, I'm going to start uh, reviewing some of the questions. Uh, uh, first one, um, uh, uh, is uh, do, do bronze plans have higher deductibles? Um, the answer is, is generally yes. Those bronze plans are higher deductible plans, although some some bronze plans will be uh, based uh, on an HMO platform. So there's either a low deductible or no deductible there. But um, e even if we took a look at other other tiered plans, silver, gold, and platinum plans uh, that will have lower deductibles, those average premium rates are still you're still going to find a lot of those plans that have. Uh, lower premiums, and so um, you know whether or not somebody rolls in a, in a bronze plan or a platinum plan, you're, you're going to probably have options in in all tiers that are uh, uh, you know presumably uh, less expensive from a premium standpoint in terms of uh, or in comparison to Cobra. Uh, there's a question: Is there a template for the election notice to send to employees? Uh, yes, at the Department of Labor website, there are model templates of both the general notice and the election notice. So uh, I would just do an internet search, uh, type in uh, uh, you know model model COBRA notices, 
and uh, that should take you right to the template. All right, reading through some uh, some more here. Um, uh, there's a question uh, about uh, specifically the state of Illinois and if uh, employees are eligible for the subsidy. Uh, the answer is in all states uh, uh, there is there is eligibility for the subsidies. Although I know right now there is um, uh, essentially a dispute going on uh, as to whether or not uh, subsidies can be offered through states that have defaulted to either what they call a partnership exchange or the federally facilitated exchanges. Uh, from the White House administration, uh, their interpretation is in all states, regardless of what exchange model you're on, uh, subsidies are eligible. So I can tell you as of now, in every state, uh, including Washington, D.C., uh, subsidies are being provided to eligible individuals. All right. Um, there's a question if somebody forgoes COBRA as well as uh, 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 coverage either in the exchange or the individual marketplace, will they be fined? Uh, the answer is yes, unless they qualify for an exemption. Uh, so now uh, based on uh, the individual shared responsibility requirements, also known as the individual mandates, uh, unless an, ex an exemption applies, uh, everybody must be covered by minimum essential coverage uh, uh, or face a penalty, and the maximum penalty in 2014 is uh, $95 or 1% of modified adjusted gross income, whichever is greater. So for most people, uh, they'll be looking at 1% of their income as a penalty unless an exemption exists. And uh, there's uh, exemptions for uh, based on religion that may qualify. There's financial hardship exemptions um, and, 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 and several others. So uh, you might need to, to look at the specific situation to determine whether or not a penalty applies. Uh, great question so far. I, I really appreciate it. All right. Just reading through some more here. We've got lots of questions about the sample notices. The Department of Labor has a has these sample notices. Um, you don't have to use the exact language. Uh, the language in these notices are what we refer, refer to as safe harbor language, meaning if you use it, you will satisfy all the obligations uh, uh, that the government requires in terms of notifying qualified beneficiaries of their uh, COBRA rights. So again, Department of Labor website, uh, do an internet search for the notices. Uh, there's a question if somebody elects COBRA for October, November, and December and then drops coverage, can they sign up in the exchange um, and will they qualify for a subsidy? Um, it, it, you know, voluntarily dropping co uh, COBRA coverage does not create a special enrollment period. So out, outside of, of that, they can enroll during the annual enrollment period. Uh, which, which does not require any, any qualifying event. Uh, the annual enrollment period, the next one is November 15th uh, of this year and carries forward through uh, February 15th of next year. So uh, you know, for somebody this year, if they had coverage October, November, December, they could drop that coverage and enroll through the exchange. Now based on when they enroll would determine their effective date. Uh, typically speaking, in most scenarios through the exchange, you must enroll by the 15th of the month to uh, uh, guarantee coverage for the first day of the following month. And, um, uh, and in this scenario, uh, assuming uh, they, they met the income thresholds, they would also be subsidy eligible. Great questions, everyone. Uh, just reading through a few more. Lots of them trying to address the ones. Again, a couple questions about uh, whether or not a copy of the presentation will go out. Uh, we will send a PDF of it, uh, and you're more than uh, 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 free to, to share that with some of your colleagues. Let's see, just reading through some more. Okay. 
All right. Well, I think it looks like I've, I've covered a, a, a good chunk of the presentation uh, questions. Uh, what I'll do, I'll tell you what, uh, I'm going to I'm going to wrap things up now here a, a few minutes early. I'll try to um, uh, print out these questions and make sure I did my best to answer all of them. And if I think I didn't get to your question, uh, I should have your your email address based on when you registered. Uh, I'll try to connect with you and uh, and answer your question uh, if I didn't if I don't think I got to it. But uh, I'm going to wrap it up here and want to thank everybody for your time. I, I hope. Uh, there's at least a couple new pieces of information you were able to to pick up. Um, you know, if you have uh, additional questions, again, feel free to to reach out to our office. Uh, the, the, the Flex Plans Department uh, will get you to uh, our Cobra specialist, and uh, we also got a lot of great material on our website. So I want to thank everybody for your time today. Uh, have a great uh, rest of the summer, and uh, hopefully we'll have you on uh, one of our upcoming webinars. Take care and have a great day.